director at Victory Church uh, in Donna Vista. You're um, the guy. He's the guy. Is that, did, I, did I do something wrong? No. no. Oh, well, nobody's come to, to find me, so I guess it wasn't too bad. So, or too good either way, right? So, uh, but yeah, I'm a worship director down there, and uh, um, I want to start by honoring my pastor and the elders at Victory. I know they're not here, but if they ever watch online, um, I'm thankful that they have allowed me some freedom in order to do some things, so I'm very thankful for that. And uh, at the same time, I want to honor y'all for sticking with me through this. Um, fair heads up, parts of this is going to be rough. Uh, but we're going to end by talking about the goodness of God. Um, for me, uh, when it comes to messages and, and preaching and things like that, it's pointless if the gospel is not involved, right? Um, the Bible talks about how the law is given to us to show that we can't live up to it. There's no way for us to meet the entirety of the law. Um, and, and so we have to have the gospel. So if we just talk about the oughtas and the oughta nots without talking about why we ought to or ought to not, there's, it's kind of pointless. So um, so we are going to end up in the gospel. Um, anytime that I get a chance, I'm going to do my best to, to preach the gospel. Um, so um, I want to start today with, uh, with something different. Normally I try to tell jokes uh, to kind of get into things, to get warmed up and, and to get everybody loosened up a little bit. But instead I'm going to tell you about a couple of guys. Um, I'm going to tell you about Nathan Barlow. So uh, he was a medical doctor who chose to utilize his skills in Ethiopia for more than 60 years. Um, Nathan dedicated his life to helping people with mossy foot. And mossy foot is a debilitating condition primarily found in rural districts on people who work in soil of volcanic origin. Um, it causes swelling and ulcers um, in the feet and lower legs. The subsequent uh, deformity that happens, the swelling, the, uh, the repeated ulcerations, and, and secondary infections make people uh, with mossy foot social outcast equivalent to lepers. So uh, shortly before Nathan died, his daughter, uh, Sharon Daly, she brought him to her home from Ethiopia uh, when, health, when his health started to fail. Uh, after only a few weeks, he couldn't handle being in the States anymore. The people he loved were still in Ethiopia, so his daughter flew him back home so he could spend his last days there. Once, this is probably my favorite little story about Nathan is, is this next little bit. So once Nathan, he, he got a toothache, the pain which was so intense that they had to, to fly, that he had to fly away from the mission field uh, to get medical attention. Nathan told the dentist that he didn't ever want to leave the mission field for the sake of his teeth again. So he had the dentist pull out all of his teeth and give him false ones so he wouldn't slow God's work in Ethiopia. Wow. Right? Like, I don't, my, they're not pretty, but I don't want to lose them. You know? so, but th this amazing man was the, the first to help these outcasts, and he spent his entire life doing so. Um, yet he died quietly without a lot of attention, and no one really knew about him. It surprised me that such a man of God would faithfully serve so many years despite minimal recognition. It's a beautiful thing to witness, really, and to, to read about. The work that Nathan started continues through his website, mossyfoot.com, if you want to look up anything about him or the work that he did. Now, I, I want to tell you about another guy, um, Simpson Reba Varapu. I've got it written down if you want to spell it and look it up later. I'm probably butchering the guy's name. Uh, Simpson, he was given his English name when he arrived at a missionary-run orphanage around the age of four. His parents had not yet named him, which happens often among younger children in poverty-stricken, lower-caste families in India. Simpson's mother was married as a child bride around the age of 13, a practice that's still common in Indian villages. Um, Simpson was her sixth child, and the one, women in the village gave her herbs to end the pregnancy so that she wouldn't have to stop working and have another mouth to feed. But the herbs didn't work. Other villagers, uh, they suggested that they try the, the English medicine, right? Uh, but when she went to the doctor and uh, to have him aborted, uh, the doctor wasn't at work that day. Praise God. 
So Simpson was born, and, and eventually his parents took him to the orphanage because they knew that he would have a better life there, um, and, and ultimately that he'd have uh, an opportunity to be educated. So it was, it was definitely a better choice, right? It's death versus orphanage. It's the orphanage. That's the way to go, right? So uh, Simpson believes that God had always, uh, has always had his hand on his life because if it had been for his mother, he would never have been born. Now, currently, Simpson splits his time between the orphanage that he started and an evangelism ministry that brings God's word to illiterate villagers through audio Bibles. And I mean that in the literal sense of the word illiterate, not making fun of anybody. They don't know how to read or write. So the only way that they can get the gospel is through audio. So uh, when asked how he lives and where he gets his salary, he answered in the most simple and humble manner, I live by faith. I don't have a family or a wife. So what do I need a salary for? He would rather have that money go to supporting another program to help people or to expose more people to the word of God. Simpson says that by living this way, he has to trust that God has his hand on his life and will keep taking care of him. He also, uh, he also says his dependence keeps him in prayer and close to God. If you've ever been broke, you know what he means, right? Yeah. To learn more about what Simpson does, you can check out Bowman.com. Uh, if you want any of this information, I'll be glad to share it with you afterwards. So, um, The lives of these men, they, they speak of a, of a great love for Christ and his people. right? This doesn't sound like men who are afraid. It sounds like men who are very much in love with God and God's people. Believers or non-believers, it doesn't matter. Um, we see scriptural evidence for this, right? Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting Amen. life. Amen. Amen, right? But these men live based upon giving their lives to other people and for other people. Mm -hmm. Their lives were a product of decisions that were made based upon love and not based upon fear. That's, that's the primary origin of most of our decisions, right? Like it's either based upon love or it's based upon fear. Sometimes even fear can be mingled in with love, right? You're afraid for your child. or So there's, there's some gray area there too. But those tend to be the biggest motivating factors for humans. Why is this important for me? Uh, for a large portion of my life, my decisions were based solely on fear. That, that's what they were based upon. And, and still it's something that I struggle with today. And, and more than likely, we'll have to fight that battle for the rest of my life. Um, God being my helper, I'm going to win every time, right? Amen. But, but, but it, it's a fear of rejection, a, a fear of, of failure, a fear of, of disappointing others, or even disappointing myself. What if, what if I don't do it right? Or what if I, what if I fall short? Or there's, there's anything, there's lots of things that we can use as the, the fear thing, right? As the, the, the reason to fear what's going on. But the more time that I spend with Christ the more that, that I want to walk on water. Maybe not necessarily literally, right? But at the same time, I, I don't want my decisions to be based in fear. Yeah. The more I, I'm with him, the more that I want my life to look crazy to other people. Amen. Right? Uh -huh. For things to not make sense. Not for my benefit at all, but so that people can see God's glory played out. Amen. Let me read this to you. Matthew 14, 27 through 29. It says, but straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. The order of that sentence is important. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy. Lord, thank you that as the song says that you are coming after us, Lord, that you are never going to leave us alone. Thank you for that, Lord. I ask that today that every single one of us walk away from this place differently because of you, because we've gotten to experience you. Lord, we already have in worship. Thank you that you're here. Thank you so much for that. Lord, we ask that, again, that you have your way today. I ask that you anoint the message. I ask that the words that I say, that they be yours and not mine. Or changes. 
mold us or break us even. Have your way with us, Lord. We love you, we trust you, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Yep. So let, let me read this. Uh, there's a couple of dry, dry bits that I'm going to go through. And if you're not uh, a scripture reader, it, it's definitely going to be a little dry. But there's some, some information here that we have to cover before we get to certain places, right? Um, Matthew 14, uh, 22 through 23. We're going to read kind of what we just read. Just give a little, a little bit before and a little bit after so we can kind of get a, a better picture of what's going on. And again, this is Peter walking on the water. All right. So 22, it says, in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Amen, right? There's a handful of things that I want for us to pay attention to in this, this passage, right? In verse number 27, he says, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. That, that phrase, it is I, um, if, if you were to, to translate it from it, the Greek version of it anyhow, it's, uh, it's I, me, ego. And if you've, it's worth looking into further than what we're going to do here. But it, it's the, the, the two words are backwards from what he says whenever he is talking in the tabernacle, when he's at church and he's reading Isaiah to the, the Pharisees and all of them. I'm sorry, what was the chapter? Uh, Matthew chapter 14. So, uh, but but that, that I me ego, right, it's the, the two words are reversed from what he says in the temple. And it's also reverse of what he says whenever, um, uh, when they come to arrest him. Um, and, and basically, this is Jesus proclaiming to be God Almighty. To give you just a little bit of backstory, um, the, during Jesus' time, they read out of a, what's called the Greek Septuagint, right? It's pictured in the Old Testament, but in Greek instead of Hebrew. That was the, the language of the day, right? And, and so whenever God told Moses, I am that I am, the phrase that's there is ego, I me. And so when Jesus says these words, he is proclaiming to be the I am. So look further into this. I promise you that when you read where you see I am, there's, I'm talking, it, it'll sock you right in the teeth in a good way. So verse number 30, in spite, this, this is probably one of my favorite parts of this passage. But when, uh, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. Not this part, the next part. Uh, began to, to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. Look, in spite of Peter being with Jesus on the water, he fails. This is probably the version of the message that everybody's heard, right? Don't take your eyes off of Christ. There's absolutely value in that, but we're, that's not what we're going to preach on today. He manages to see his circumstances instead of Jesus. The end of verse 30 is probably one of my favorite parts. Leading into verse 31, Peter says, Lord, save me. And the very next words are, and immediately. There's no wait. There's no delay. There's no long four-hour prayer session. There's no, no big, long repentance. There's, there's none of that. It's just immediate salvation. This is beautiful. And I, I'm not saying that there's not a place for repentance. Please don't hear that. I want you to see that, that, that God sees the heart more than he sees any words that we can spew out of our mouths. That's right. mm -hmm. He knows what's going on in here. I guarantee you that Peter was sorry for looking at the waves instead of Jesus as he was sinking, right? 
So uh, verse number 33, let's read that one. Uh, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. They recognized Jesus for who he is and then begin to praise and worship. This should be something that's natural for every believer. Like the, in moments where we recognize who he is, right? Like in the song that we were singing just a few minutes ago. When we recognize his goodness and his mercy, even if, it, if we're sitting at our desk at work, it should just, there should be something that snaps in us and says, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Just the recognition of who Jesus is, and especially in a believer's life, and a life that's changed by Christ, should provoke praise and worship. Amen. Now, this isn't the only time that we see Peter doing something different than the rest of the, the disciples, Amen. right? Peter had a tendency to do some things that, that other people wouldn't do. Um, we're going to read John chapter 18, verses 3 through 11. This is where Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, just to give you the overall picture of what's going on. Um, so John, he says, uh, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither, that's a really hard word for me to say, with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come unto him, went forth and said to him, whom seek ye? Then answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. That Jesus said unto him, I am he. We see ego, I me again. He is proclaiming to be God. And Judas also, just to be clear, this is not a oneness message. Oneness, Trinity, whatever side you fit on. The Bible says that there's a Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it also says here, o Israel, the Lord your God is one God. I'm not a either or, I am a yes and yes doesn't mean I understand it. I just know that God's word is true. And so if it says both, both have to be true. Exactly. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. Maybe one day he'll show us, right? But he says, he says, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Pay very close attention right here. And, it, and soon, then, uh, as, as soon as he said to him, I am he, ego, I mean, they went backward and fell to the ground. If you have an act of imagination like, like I do, you can picture men coming with, with spears and sword, exactly, falling backwards yeah. at hearing his words, I am he. Ego I me is what he said. And I can almost picture Jesus in the fullness of God resting inside of this man saying, I am he, like he's daring him to come at him. But what does he do? This is the, literally, like you can picture the creator of heaven and earth, of everything, looking at them and going, I'm the one you're looking for, and then falling on the ground backwards. Ooh. Right? It'll yeah. give you goosebumps when you think about it. And then, and then the, the stupidity or the bravery, either one of the men that continued to arrest him. How are you? Like, I'd have quit right then and there. I'd have been like, I'm done. See you, fellas. I'm going home. Yeah. That would have been the end of my job. So... Uh, I get I get tied up on that part. That's not the purpose of the whole message, but that's still an amazing part of that scripture. They fell to the ground. Then ask he to ask him again, whom seek ye? Right? Like after, after laying on the ground, who are you looking for? Right? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am He. Ego, I me again. If therefore you seek me, let us go. Let let these go their way. And he's referring to the people that were with him. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So we see him in verses 5, 6, and 8, again, proclaim, I am he, right? He proclaims to be God. Verse number 6, let's read it real quick. He said, uh, that's the, I don't have to read it. It's the part where they fall backwards on the ground. This is amazing to me. If you couldn't tell, I get hung up right there every single time. My imagination starts putting these pictures together. Again, the bravery or stupidity of the guys that were there is amazing to me. John's gospel is the only one that records this, by the way. John kind of seemed to be obsessed with Christ as, as God, right? So if you, if you start with the beginning of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? He starts his lineage at being God. So verse number 10, uh, let's read that one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. 
Peter decides in this moment that the Savior was worth dying for and draws first blood. Verse number 11, we see that Jesus corrects Peter and then tells him why. Luke records things just a little bit differently. It's the same overall picture. Let me read to you. Uh, it's Luke 22, verses 49 through 51. Um, he says, and, and, and excuse me, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Verse number 50, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye thus far, and touched his ear and healed him. So, verse number 49, we see Peter asked Jesus, should we kill him? Verse number 50, Peter, in his impatient, as impatient as he is, right, he goes ahead and decides to, to take an ear as a warning, right? Ready to die at the moment, surrounded by soldiers and guards and priests and all kinds of people, takes an ear. I love the fact that Peter is impatient and can't wait on Jesus. It's, it gives me a little hope, right? Like, how, how often do we do the same thing, right? Pray for something and be like, all right, God, well, I'm going to go do this, right? Verse number 51, it's, uh, and Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far, and he touched the ear and healed him. Jesus heals Malchus in the middle of this. So, so not only do they fall backwards to the ground, but they witness someone being healed. They witness the healing power of God. And they still continue to go through this. This is, I'm telling you, man, this is nuts to me, the, the little details that are going on in here. It's surprising to me that, that Luke is the only gospel where this healing is recorded. I, I guess it's because he's a doctor, and, and maybe that's just something that, a little thing that he picked up on. Um, but uh, among all the chaos of the moment, Jesus performs a miracle, and Luke is the only one that thought it was worth mentioning. Malchus' life was forever altered by an encounter with Christ. But in the moment, the other writers of the Gospels miss something beautiful happening, seemingly being metaphorically or maybe even spiritually, just like Peter when he's walking on the water. They start paying attention to the, the, the problems, the trials, the circumstances, and take their eyes off of what Jesus is actually doing in that moment. It's chaos. It's real. What's happening is very real, but they miss this beautiful moment that happens. Matthew and Mark, they record the same story, but with a, a couple of details that the other guys missed. Uh, both of them record uh, at the very end. This is Matthew 26, 56, and Math, or Mark 14, 50. Uh, this is the very end of those verses. It said, uh, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. All of the disciples, even Peter, after deciding that Christ was worth dying for in that moment, they left him right where he was. To, to, to remove the fanciness of the word forsook, it means to send away, to let go, to disregard, or to leave. Mark records the same thing. So not only does Peter mess up by cutting off Malchus' ear, uh, the implied text says that Peter and the rest of the disciples left Jesus and escaped safely out of danger. Hmm. little side note here, the healing of Malchus is mentioned one time. The power of Christ's words knocking people down is mentioned one time, but the failure of the disciples is mentioned twice. Again, not necessarily relevant to the whole conversation, but still something that I found pretty neat. It's easy for us to look at these passages and say, look, see, Peter messed up, right? Like, surprise, mm -hmm. another human fails, right? Mm -hmm. Is it valuable? Absolutely, yes. You better believe it. But it's not really that surprising that somebody messes up. And it's really not surprising that Jesus chooses messed up people to do these wild things, right? And he calls them his best friends. Like, don't get me wrong here. Praise God that he's given us a, a, a way out of, of circumstances when we fail, right? What do we do? We cry out for salvation. We return our focus to Christ. We stand up and we continue to push forward. Peter was absolutely imperfect. But Peter had a way of stepping out further than those around him were willing to go. And Peter's mistakes have been talked about over and over again. Like I said, if you've, if you've been in church for very long, it's, you've heard that passage preached over and over again where don't take your eyes off of Christ. Again, valuable information. But to me, this is almost a side note. It's not the most important piece in this passage. Yes, Peter took his eyes off of Christ, sank like a rock, 
Here's another thing that, that, that I love about Peter failing, right? Uh, in the span of two paragraphs, when they're walking down the road, and uh, uh, Jesus asks, uh, who do men say that I am? And they go, well, it's, you're this prophet or that prophet or this, that, and the other. And then, and then P and Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter replies back, you know, you're the son of God. And he says that it was the Holy Ghost that's told you this. It wasn't men that, that revealed this to you. Jesus calls him, calls Peter, the rock on which his church will be built. Whether it be Peter himself, right, or or the, the, the idea that Peter knew who Jesus was, uh, one way or the other. He said, you're, you're, this is the rock that I'm going to build my church. And then, like three sentences later, he calls Peter Satan. <laughs> right? Like, how do you get called the rock on which the church is going to be built? And then Satan, in the same, tr like, walking down the same road, I could pick, like, just him going, dear God, why, Peter? Why do you, like, why do you say? All right, so... Uh, the other, another thing that, that uh, Peter messed up with, uh, he let Jesus down right before he was arrested. Peter couldn't stay awake while Jesus was uh, literally sweating blood from stress. I, I don't know if you know this. This isn't just some supernatural thing that happened. This is actually a real medical condition. Uh, hematidrosis, I think, is the, the pronunciation of it. Uh, but it's a very rare medical condition that causes you to ooze or sweat blood from the skin when you're not cut or injured and can sometimes be, uh, be caused by extreme stress or fear, such as facing death, torture, or severe ongoing abuse. Yes, Peter was quick-tempered. He drew a sword too soon, cut off the servant's ear. Yes, he denied Christ. We're all familiar with that story, right? It's shortly after the one where, where they came and arrested him. Or, or, that's right before. But he, he talks, he looks at Peter and he says, look, man, uh, as, as much as you want to die with me before this is over with, you're going to deny me before the rooster crows three times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Peter weeping bitterly over this. This, to me, is one of the first signs of Peter's love for Christ. Not in his denial of Christ, but that after he realizes that he messed up, that he, he weeps bitterly. He hurt his friend. And once all this happened, Peter is completely overwhelmed by his sin. Self-discovery of his own weakness. And then he quits the apostolic team. And then he goes back to fishing. The only thing that he knew. He was so bothered and so upset by what he had done that he, he thought that he wasn't worthy. Which in reality, he wasn't. None of us are, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's Christ that makes us worthy. But he, he, he was so hurt by his own actions, by his own failure, that he says, you know what, man, I'm just going to go fishing. I can't do this anymore. I'm not, I'm not cut out for it. I, this doesn't work for me. Peter failed in a lot of ways. And, and to repeat, Peter... But, Peter had this way of stepping out and doing things that the other ones wouldn't. So, of, of course, Peter's going to be very visibly failing in front of other people. But Peter was one of the inner three disciples. He was there when Jesus was transfigured. It's a beautiful passage. If you don't know what it is, look up Jesus' transfiguration. It's worth reading about. Jesus walked on the water with Jesus, and he was willing to die when they came to arrest Jesus. So later, we also see Peter doing some other wild things. We see, see Peter lays his hands on believers, and poof, they receive the Holy Ghost, right? This is pretty amazing. Peter heals a guy who can't walk into the temple. He helps uh, Enos, I guess, it's, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Um, I hope that wasn't his name, though. Uh, but, he, but he helps this person who was paralyzed to walk again. And then he brings Tabitha back to life. Right? Yes, Peter failed over and over and over again. But his life was filled with, with literally God-honoring adventure. His whole life glorified God. Even the failures, like this is a whole other message, but even those failures glorify God. Not necessarily in the failing, but in what Christ does with the failings, right? The Bible says that, that there's only one unforgivable sin. And that means that regardless of what you've done, with that one single exception, right, you have a call on your life. God has chosen you and has things for you to do. 
It's me too. Let's just start saying us. Let's be, let's yeah. be inclusive. I'm standing on the, the, on the floor, not on the platform. There's no difference between me and you. There's no super Christians. There's no, we need this, right? I want to read Matthew chapter 14 again, 24 through 33. But I want to highlight a couple of words that are here. Verse number 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto him, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto him, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. We see that, that phrase again, right? And began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And he said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they were, they were, excuse me, then they that were on the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Verse number 24, we see tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. They are in the middle of a very real storm. Verse number 26, it says, They were troubled and cried out in fear. Now, if that doesn't sound like the last nine months for a lot of people, right? I mean, it's, it's super weird times, man. Like, I, God's in control, though. I can tell you that. Verse number 27, he says, be not afraid. Verse number 28, he says, and Peter answered him and, and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. This is another sign that Peter knows who Jesus is. I got to be honest with you. If I saw one of y'all walking on the water, I wouldn't ask you to, to tell me to come out to the water. Like, it's just not the, it's not the first thing that would come to mind. But he knew who Jesus was, and so he knew what he was capable of, and he knew what could happen, and the possibilities were, were infinite. There's no box that we could put Jesus in, right? Amen. Verse number 29, our, our, our Savior's response to his call is beautiful. It's one word, come. Again, verse number 29, we see Peter walking on the water. And in verse number 33, we see them praise and worship. Jesus for who he is. I want you to picture what's happening on the boat during this time. This is, it's, to me, is one of the wildest passages that are there, but there's all kinds of uh, subtext that, that we don't necessarily get in the scripture, but, but it's very easy to assume a couple of things, right? You can imagine that one, just like it says, everybody's scared half to death on the boat. It's terrifying. But you can also picture that there's people on the boat that think Peter's crazy. Why on earth would anybody ask to go walk on the water? This is the most irrational thing that anybody, like, I can't come up with a better example of something that's irrational, to try and walk on the water. You can almost imagine the ones that had their heart right looking at Peter and going, Peter, what, what are you doing? What? There's a storm. You're going to drown. Why, why would you get out of the boat? Why would you leave the safety that we have right here? Please don't do it, Peter. I don't want to watch you die. I don't want to have to, to, to fish your body out of the water. That's just the ones that their hearts are right. There had to be a couple of them that were like, Peter, come on, man. You know you're not going to do this. Why? Why would you ask to get on the water? This is stupid, Peter. I hope that James and John were on the boat as well. The inner three disciples were Peter, James, and John. All three of those guys, they saw some things that the rest of the group never got to see. Transfiguration is one of them. But I hope that, that, that James and John were on the boat. It doesn't say that they were, but I, I, I'd, I'd love it if they were. I can imagine one of them standing there just in complete and total shock, St knowing exactly that this is going to work, but still just mind blown that this is about to happen. And I can picture the other one holding Peter's hand as he's stepping over the rail. Right? Come on, man. Let's go. I want to see it happen. Right? The sons of thunder, James and John. You can imagine that at least one of them was super excited to see what was about to happen. 
whether he sank or swam or, or, or actually walked on the water, they had to be willing, just right there ready to go. You said that's the bad friend? <laughs> I want to watch. I want to see what happens. At the very least, we got to be the James and the John in that story, right? The ones that are, like, if God has called somebody out onto the water, right? If we're not going to be that person, right? The very least we need to be is the one that's holding our hand as they step over the rail. The, exactly encouraging, excited to see God move in somebody's life. Not jealous, not envious, not, not hating what's happening, right? But still, you can imagine that the majority of them were, were kind of irritated. And then there also had to be somebody, once Peter got out onto the water, there had to be somebody that was like, oh, man, there goes Peter again, doing something with Jesus, you know, <laughs> just being all super religious and whatnot. Oh, can you believe that guy, right? It just, you can imagine that, that there was some chaos that was happening on the boat at this time and a mix of emotions and attitudes. And I mean, these were normal, everyday guys. They, they weren't... They weren't super churchy people. Most of them were fishermen, right? So there had to be some regular old everyday thoughts that ran through their heads during that moment. Here's, here's the problem with all of this. And this is turning point in the message, for lack of a better way to put it. How many of us are still in the boat? Yeah. <laughs> Where does our heart sit in the middle of that? If we're not going to get out of the boat, the very least we need to be is the ones holding somebody's hand, cheering Amen. them on, supporting, helping, doing what needs to be done behind the scenes. Let me give you this scenario. COVID, Corona, right? We're sitting here scared half to death, focused on the possibility of losing our life, our freedoms, our, our normal way of life. When in reality, we could be asking, God, how do you want to use me? Lord, what would you have me do in this time? Who can I hug? <laughs> I'm a hugger. We, we talked about this earlier, right? It's hard. It's so hard for me at the moment that they were like, no, you got to stay six feet away. I'm like, I can't just wave at people. Like, I'm not that guy. <laughs> My wife actually told me she was like, uh, she says, uh, she says, you can't just hug people anymore. And I'm like, okay, all right, I'll, I'll ask first. So then I started asking people, is it okay if I hug you? And, and, then, and then she was like, you, you have to tell them they can say no. Because like, there's you know, so many, that, remember that fear, right? The fear being one of the determining factors. There's so many people that are afraid of rejection and disappointing other people that they would just hug me. As awkward as it is, like they would just go ahead and be like, oh, okay. And she's like, you can't do that. You have to tell them they can say no. If you're going to insist on hugging people, tell them they can say no. It's been, a, it's been a hard few months for me. That's the worst that I've had to deal with. So... Um, But here, here's the thing, right? All, all jokes aside, I see Christians posting about their rights and their freedoms being taken away every single day. But I rarely see those people talking about the freedom that only Jesus can offer to the world. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you think that your posting is actually going to convince those that are across the aisle of the truth, regardless of whether you're left or right, or far left, far right, in the middle, doesn't matter. Do you think that you're going to convince the other person that you're calling stupid that they're stupid? It ain't going to happen. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's the inside voice, like inside the head voice. Whoever said it, like that's the way you got to. You keep those thoughts, right? Most likely, it's not going to change anybody's mind or anybody's opinion. Like, if you post five or six times a day, or if you're the post person that posts five or six times a week just about political stuff, right? Um, it, look, there's nothing wrong with, with posting, right? But I can promise you that you're not going to convince the person on the other side of the aisle that they're stupid and they should change their mind. It's not going to happen. Let me ask you this again. Does it look like hearts, minds, and lives being changed? It's possible. It's not probable, though. But does this look more like sowing discord? One last question. Will this ruin your ability to witness to these people in the future? 
What if you knew that because of your political views or the way that you felt on a certain thing that it would ruin your chance to tell somebody the good news of Jesus Christ? Is it worth telling them that they're dumb? Is it worth even having a civil conversation where the two of you no longer respect each other? I don't think so. Like, let me read James chapter 1 to you, 19, verses, or 19 through 27. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. When in reality, for most of us, it is slow to hear, swift to speak, and swift to wrath. Yeah. How often do you want to go tell Aunt Betty about how dumb she is for voting on this particular one topic? <laughs> it's the first, I can't, I can't sleep. I'm, you're pacing the floor. You're walking back and forth going, you know, I'm going to give Aunt Betty a piece of my mind. Mm -hmm. She shouldn't be like that. She shouldn't vote that way. Why does she feel like this? I use voting because that's the particular turmoil that we're going through as a society at the moment. Verse number 20, let me read this to you. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Our anger, our, our being upset about these things is not going to show people the love of Christ. That's Verse number 21, wherefore lay apart, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That leads to the abundance of wrong. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Basically, shut up, let's work. Right? Mm -hmm. If you're angry, it's shut up and work. If you're not angry, it's tell people the gospel, right? For if, any man be a, or for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious... And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. It's, it's for me, is what it's saying. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Look, are there things that are happening that, that need to be prevented? Are there things that, that at the very least we need to talk about, right? Yeah, a absolutely. Let me be very clear about that. Look, I, I can't stand wearing a mask. I'm, I'm not that guy, right? I, I don't like being muzzled. I can't stand the fact that in our last stimulus bill, there was more money that went to strange programs overseas than it did its own people. This is... It actually makes me very angry when I get to thinking about it. There's a handful of people that I believe need to answer for what they've done in this nation. That sit on both sides of the aisle, to be very clear. But it's easy for us to focus on these waves, right? It's easy for us to focus on these distractions and, and the things that are, that are going wrong, right? They're distractions. The problems, the waves that Peter faced were absolutely real. He was in the middle of the storm. The wind was blowing. The thunder's cracking, right? Uh, the, the lightning's flashing. It is very much a real situation that he's found himself in. Peter's problems are... are and, and, uh, excuse me. Peter was in a spot where only Jesus could help them. Amen. It's not just with COVID... It's with nothing at all. We'll use any excuse that we can muster to not be used by God. And we'll still come to church on Sunday and shout, praise God. You go, well, well preacher, I, I just want enough that I don't go to hell. You say, well, well, preacher, I still need to feel safe, right? After all, safety first. I need security. 
What if they make fun of me, though? What if I don't have all the answers? What about my job? What about my insurance? How, how will I provide for my family? How will I take care of them? What about having some folks that are brave enough just to stick their toes in the water? Let me point this out to you. Peter's feet were wet before he ever stepped out. His feet are dangling over the edge of the boat. You know that there had to be water. This talks about wind and waves, and the waves were high, and the, the waves were the thing that took his, his focus off of Christ, right? So you, you can imagine that his feet were not dry until he got into the water. His feet were wet before he actually stepped on the water. There were some split-second decisions that had to be made in his head and for him to recognize that this is ridiculous. This is insane. This is not going to work. And then it clicks in his head, but I know who Jesus is. Yeah. And we know that he loved him. And between the two, Peter ended up walking on the water. Now, I, I, here's the thing. I don't want, want us to focus on on how we've messed up, right? We have, we know it. it, it just, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's, there's no getting around this. But I, I want for us to focus on Him and regain our courage and our strength. Amen. Let me put it to you like this. If we want to get out of the boat, we've got to get our feet wet. Now, I've thought a lot about, about how this looks. <laughs> I've literally, I've, I, wrapping this up was a hard thing for me to do. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a guy that'll stand up here and like, and, and just give it to you left and right, right? Just, just constantly punching on people is real hard for me to do. Um, again, going back to fear, right? I don't want you to hate me. I don't want for you to think that that I'm a terrible person or that I'm, I'm, I'm spitting hellfire and brimstone, right? I'm just a part of the devil. It is. Exactly, right? There, there is room for that. I thought a lot about this. I've prayed. I've paced the floor back and forth. Here's what I've come to. What's the point? We must fall in love with Christ. Come on. Amen. That's, that's where we have to be at. If you're in love with him, none of this is going to come as a chore or a checkbox that has to be done. Amen. Will it be hard? Absolutely. It's going to put you in situations that you can't explain to people that aren't going to make sense. Those that love you are going are, are to yell and scream at you and tell you that what you're doing is wrong and it's from a good place. And those that don't like you are going to yell and scream at you and tell you that you're wrong because they don't like it. <laughs> but if you're in love with Christ, this stuff is is just fruit. It's just a natural byproduct of, of our love for Christ. And because we've been with the Lord, darkness begins to fade away. Mm -hmm. Right? All the lights were off in the room, and I, I, I lit a match, I lit a, a cigarette lighter. It light up a good portion of this place. But darkness can't be in the presence of light. Mm -hmm. Darkness has to leave. Let me ask you this. What happens to a plant when it's in its proper environment? It grows, right? In, the, in the, the, the sense of what we're talking about here, fruit is produced, right? Live in a very agricultural county, right? Stick an orange tree in the right soil with the right light and enough water. Oranges are going to show up. It's just what happens. You don't have to tell the tree to do that. You don't have to do anything special. You just have to do what it needs. Oranges grow, right? Spending time with God... Being filled with the Holy Ghost, it produces fruit. And just to be very clear, fruit is never for us, Amen. right? You don't ever see an orange tree eating an orange. Right. <laughs> and fruit takes time to grow. Amen. There are some things that when we come to God that are immediate, that ha they change just instantly, right? But there's some things that are going to take a while for us to get through. We carry a lot of garbage, and there's a lot of garbage that we just love to tote around. 
right? I've used this illustration before when it comes to talking about freedom and healing. For some people, they've been in chains and bondage so long that this is the only way they know how to work. And when you free them and you take the chains off, this is an uncomfortable spot to be in where I can use, but I don't know how to do my work like this. So let me go back to my chains. I can do what I, I know how to do this way. Let's do it like this. It works just fine, see? <laughs> Look, I, I can't make any of this happen. There's no amount of motivational talk that anybody can give or, or no amount of begging, for that matter, that we can do that will convince each other that there's work for us to be done. Like, I, I know this, you know this, right? We all know that there's work to be done. And the only way that this is happening is through the love of Christ. And to remove the... The church language from this, and to put it into real world, real world terms, we got to know who Jesus is, and we have to love and trust him. How did this happen for Peter? Same way. Peter knew who Jesus was, is. He loved him deeply. So the last time that I was here, I kind of read off of a list of the things that God's word says who we are. I want to read some scriptures of what God's word says he is. I also have to be clear about this part. Head knowledge does you no good. You can be as, as biblically sound, as theologically right, as you know, doctrinally lined up with whatever church you want to. And, and unless you've got a relationship with God, unless you know who he is, unless you love him, it doesn't matter. Amen. It's not about the head, it's about the heart. So let me break down. This is from cover to cover. The Bible points to who Jesus and who God is, right? But these are just a few. In Exodus 15, 11, he says, It calls him majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds and doing wonders. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, The Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers. 2 Chronicles 30 verse 9 says, The Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Amen, right? Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? But what does it take just an immediate, Lord, forgive me, man, show me what I need to do. Show me where to put my foot down next. Amen. 2 Samuel 22, 32 through 34, um, it says that God is our rock. It says that he arms us with strength and he makes our way perfect. Psalm 18, verse 30 says, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless and he shields us. He shields all who take refuge in it. Psalm 50, verse 6 says, He is righteous. He is a God of justice. Psalm 54, verse 4 says, God is our help, and the Lord is the one who sustains me. Psalm 62, 7 through 8, it says, My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is, a, he is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times. And this is my favorite part of this verse. Oh, people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. You can hear David shouting. God is our refuge. Amen. And this had to come from a place of fear, right? Yeah. He's seeking a place of refuge. Fear is real, and I'm not trying to tell you that, that we don't have it for a reason. I'm not trying to get into that debate. I'm just telling you that, that we focus on God. I'm going to get sidetracked real quick. We focus on God. We focus on his love, that he is our rock and our foundation, that he is our refuge in times of trouble, that in moments like we're in right now as a country, as a people, as God's children, that we know who God is. Amen. David calls him his refuge, right? Let me keep reading this to you. Um, where is that? Uh, oh, people. Yeah, there we go. Psalm 84, 11 through 12, it says, For the Lord is the sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. 
The Lord Almighty blessed is the one who trusts in you. Psalm 86, verse 15, it says, A God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 116, verse 5 says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Isaiah 40, verse 28, it says, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Isaiah 61, verse 1 calls him sovereign Lord. Malachi, verse 3, 6 says, The Lord does not change. John 1, verse 5, it says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. John 4, verse 24 says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Ephesians 2, 4 says, he is rich in mercy. Hebrews 12, verse 29 says, God is a consuming fire. 1 Timothy 1 says that he is the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. Exodus 3.14 says, I am who I am. This is the God that we serve. Let me rephrase that. These are characteristics of the God that we serve. You want to know who he is? You want to know his name? Let me read these to you. This is a, a nearly exhaustive list of the names that God has given in, in the Bible. It calls him the Lord of hosts. My favorite one, it calls him Abba, which translates to daddy. Right? This is not the old man waiting for you to mess up so he can yell and scream at you and tell you, tell you to get off of his lawn or, or waiting for a baseball to go through his window so he can shout at you. This is Abba. This is Daddy who sings over his children. Right? You've got the verse written right over there. He sings over you. This is the God that we serve. It calls him Almighty God. It calls him the Ancient of Days, the Architect, Avenger, Bridegroom, Buckler, Builder of all things, Commander of the Army of the Lord, a compassionate and gracious God. He is a, a consuming fire. He is Creator of heaven and earth. He is our Deliverer, our dwelling place, our eternal King. He is Everlasting Father. He is Everlasting God, our eternal God. He is the Everlasting Light. He is our faithful creator. He is our faithful God and the God of truth. He is our father. He is the father in heaven of compassion, of glory, of light. He is the father of the fatherless and the orphans. He is the forgiving God. He is the former of all things. He is our fortress. He is the glorious father. He is the glorious sword. He is the glory and the strength of Israel, his children, his people. He is God. He is God and Father. He is God and Father of all. He is God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of all comfort, all grace, and of all the earth. He is the God of Bethel. He is the God of gods. Lowercase g in that point. He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the God of hope, of Israel, of love and peace, of our fathers. He is the God of peace. He is the God of seeing, the God of steadfastness and encouragement. He is the God of my salvation. Amen. He is God my Savior, God the Father. He is a great and awesome God. He is the, the great God and Savior, the great King. He's healer. He's heavenly Father. He is our help and our strength. He is the helper of the fatherless. He is a hiding place, that refuge that David talked about. He is the high and lofty one, the high tower, the highest. He is holy. He is holy Father. He is the holy one of Israel. He is the home of justice. Amen. He is hope. He is the hope of Israel, the hope of our fathers. He is the horn of my salvation. He's the jealous and avenging God. He is judge of all the earth. He is the just and mighty one, the keeper. He is the king and God. He is king eternal, immortal, and invisible. He is king of all the earth, king of glory, of heaven, of Israel, of kings. He's yeah. the king of nations, yeah. king of saints, and king of all ages. Woo. He is the king over the whole earth. He is the lawgiver. He is the lifter up of my head. Amen. He is the light of Israel. He is the living God. He is Lord. He is Yahweh. This is the God that we serve. He is the Lord of all the earth. He is the Lord of lords. He is the loving God. He is majesty on high. He is maker of heaven and earth. He is the man of war or the warrior. He is the mighty one of Jacob. He is the, the mighty warrior, our dread champion. He is the most high God. He is my glory. He is my God and my king. He is my song. He is my strength. He's the one who inhabits eternity. 
His portion, he's the portion of my inheritance. He is the potter and I'm the clay. He is the prince of peace. He is our protector. He is the protector and defender of the widows. He is our kinsman redeemer. This is a beautiful phrase. He is not only my God, he is not only my Savior, but he is my kinsman, he's my friend. Amen. That relationship that we talked about is not one of an angry old man and us, it is, it is, is a friend. Don't get me wrong, Lord is absolutely true. He is Lord and he is God and he is King, but he is my friend. And he's called me his. Yeah. He's told me you are mine. That's right. He said, not just to me, he's told us you are mine. Yeah. He is my refuge. He is the righteous father. He is the righteous judge, the righteous one. He is the rock eternal, the rock of my salvation, and the rock of refuge. He is the ruler of all things. He is the savior of all men. For the Florida folks, he is shade. He is our shelter, our shepherd, our shield, our song, our sovereign Lord. He is the fountain of living water. He is the strength of his people. He is the strong deliverer, the strong fortress, the strong refuge, the strong tower. He is the stronghold of my life. He is the sun. He is the sustainer of my soul, the upholder of my life. He is the, the Lord of peace, the Lord of hosts, the Lord our banner. He is the Lord our righteousness, the Lord who sanctifies you. He is the true pasture. He is the upright one. He is the very great reward. He is wonderful counselor. Mighty God, Prince of Peace, right? right? He is Yah. In the middle of one of the Psalms, there is this word. It's, it's Y-A-H or J-A-H if you see it. It's one of the only words in the whole Bible that's in all capitals. Yah. That's what you yell in the face of the enemy. That's the word that you use. You look at it, whether you pronounce it Yah or Jah, it doesn't matter. But that's, that's the God that we serve. The one that stands behind us. Amen. Amen. He is the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. He is Yahweh. If you're unfamiliar with that pronunciation, he is Jehovah. He is the one true God. He is the Almighty. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the I am that I am. This identifies you more than anything else. This is the one that has said you are mine. Yeah. This is the one that has called you his child. Yeah. Like again, who sings over you. The Lord of all creation. The one who sits above everything says you are mine and sings over you. Amen. Like a mom or a dad singing over their kid in a crib. Because that's what we are. We're, we're foolish kids. And he still says I love you. And he sings songs over top. This is beautiful. Every time, again, the, the active imagination, every time that I, I hear those words, I, I picture it happening. That the one who sits on the throne, he sings over me. Amen. And he says, you are mine. John 1, 3, 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Things should be different. Things should seem strange to him. Should be curious to him almost. How is it that in the middle of a, a time like this that you prosper? How is it that in, a, in the middle of a time where you're not prospering that you still continue to smile? Right? Let's really put both ends of that spectrum. How is it that, that despite all of the things that you go through, that you can still come to church and lift your hands and shout praise God? Amen. And I, let me tell you a story about my dad. My dad died penniless. He's broke. Didn't have a thing to his name. In fact, he owed taxes for, for an ex-wife of his. Like, so he, he didn't just die penniless, he died on IRS money. And if y'all come after me for it, I ain't got it. Just talking to him on the internet. So <laughs> on his tombstone, we wrote, Jesus loves you. When people would ask, he said it for years. He 
They look at him and say, Brother Bill, how are you doing? He said, God's better than me than anybody else in the world. And the folks that know him would look at him and be like, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. You know, he's, he's, he don't look like he's that good to you. One day I asked him, I said, what do you mean when you say this? He said, God's better to me than you are. A man that didn't have anything, that had to depend upon his kids to care for him. All the way to his deathbed, he was a praiser, a worshiper. One night he came out, he, he kind of lost his mind a little bit before he left. This is one of my favorite memories of him. He's a very uh, uh, modest man, right? He's a guy that wore jeans and a long sleeve shirt to the beach. It might have been because he burned in the shade. <laughs> But he still wore that stuff to the beach. He didn't even wear didn't even wear short sleeve shirts. Right? Didn't matter where he went. That was, was just the guy that he was. And one night, in the middle of his dementia, he comes out in the living room and his whitey tidy is going, "Lord, have your way." <laughs> <laughs> even in the middle of being crazy, he still knew who God was. Amen. Amen. He still loved Jesus. The Bible says that a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. He didn't leave a penny for me or my sisters. But he ingrained in us a love of God Amen. that when I got older, I couldn't depart from. Because I, I knew who God was. I knew the truth and I could see it. Let me wrap this up. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, it says, And then Moses was lifted up, or as Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, or everlasting life, depending on the translation that you have. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil they, we've allowed fear to control us we've allowed the thoughts and the, the opinions of other people or what social media or the news says ought to be control us and we've, we've taken our focus off of Christ again I don't want to focus on that part I want for us to remember that it's okay we will fail. We will fall short of God's glory. But he loves us. That's right. And he has chosen us. He has chores for us to do work that needs to be done. Verse number 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. He that, that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. There's no way for us to step out on the water without Christ. That's right. There's no way for us to live a life that is exceptional, regardless of how you want to define exceptional, like in real world physical terms, right? It's impossible for us to do this without Christ, without knowing who he is and without being in a relationship with him and being in love with him. So I want to leave you with, with this. This, this, is, this is where the plane lands, I guess, right? How do we do this? Get your word. I know that it's been preached from this pulpit over and over and over and over, and just about any church that believes God's word, it'll be told to you. Get in your word. Get in your word. Doesn't matter how much you do it, we don't do it enough. It's, it's every one of us. We fall short in it. And secondly, I want for you to pray. 
I want for you to find a time every single day to talk to God. You go, okay, well, my, my life is full. I got kids. I got this, that, and the other. I don't know when I'm going to do this. What am I going to do? Take the time, right? You got, do you drive to work? Turn your radio off. Pray. Spend time with God on the way to work. You know the first thing that comes to your mind in the morning? Let it be Him. Find somebody that you can partner up with that will hold you accountable. There's an, there's an app on, on your phone. Uh, it's a version Bible app. And a lot, lots and lots of people have it. If you don't, it's free. Get it. Tons of different translations, so it can make it easy for you to read. They have also Bible plans that are on there for reading. You can read through the whole Bible in a year. You can do three-day Bible studies or, or devotionals. You can do there's infinite possibilities with what they have. But the, this is the part that I really like about it. You and I can be friends on there, right? We can, we can be friends, and, and we can go through a study together. Here's the thing that some people might not like. It'll tell you who's made it through today's little <laughs> message or not. It'll put a little checkbox by your name. It's, I mean, it's, it, it made me read it yesterday. At 9 o'clock, I sat down, and I was, I've been thinking about this. I told you I've been wrestling with this message, and mine wasn't checked off. So I, I ain't going to get beat today. <laughs> but I mean, find some accountability. Find somebody, and not somebody that's going to beat up on you, right? That's not the point. Iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to push each other. We're supposed to love each other enough to say, look, man, let's go. Most of us are, are not water walkers, right? There's a boat full of people that didn't get out of the boat. So it may not be God's will for you to, to exactly walk on water, but I can tell you that there's some things that will be exceptional about your life. I can tell you that we need to seek after that deeper relationship with Christ. You go, okay, well, reading the Word's really hard for me. That app that I just told you about, they got audio Bibles on there for free. You can listen to it. Oh, you don't have time to read? You got a radio. You got a phone that's got a speaker on it, right? On the way to work, throw on a chapter, right? If you still find it hard, I want for you to find a place to be honest with God and go, God, I, I love you, man, but I don't know how to do this. I I'm not, me personally, I'm not a reader. It's so hard for me to do. I have to read at conversation pace, right, in order to gather what I've actually read and remember it and hold on to it. But I got to do it, right? And we can ask God to strengthen that desire for us to get closer to Him. Tell Him that you want to walk on water. Tell Him that, look, okay, let's just let fear determine how far we go with this. You don't want to walk on water? Just tell him that you know that there's more. And whatever you have in store, man, give it to me. Let me see it. What did Moses say? Show me your glory. He wants to be in a relationship with us. That great big list that I read off, the creator of all things, Yahweh, he loves you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. Yah. 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 Yeah. That's one of my other favorite names for him. And it's intended to be yelled in the face of the enemy. Amen. This is Let's coming go. at you like a roar, right? Yeah. Yah. Yeah. Yah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'll tell you what, let, let's pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our failings, of our shortcomings. We know that you, you know what they are. We, we know that we're going to do stupid things again, that we're going to fall short of your glory. Lord, forgive us for where we fall short. Forgive us for the wrong things that we do, the wrong attitudes, or the, the wrong steps that we take, or the, the being impatient, or whatever it is. Forgive us, Father. Lord, I ask that every one of us, that, that we have a renewed love for you, that our, our first love return. That every day that we remember who you are, that we remember that you love us, and that no matter where we are, that you're not done with us. No matter how far we've fallen away, that you're not done with us. No matter how bad we messed up in the moment, that you're still Abba, that you're still Daddy. I ask that every one of us have a, a new respect for who you are. 
I ask that you increase in us the desire to spend time with you, to spend time in your word, to spend time in prayer, and to point other people to you in word and in action. Lord, you are so good to us. Thank you that you have called us yours. You've called us your children. That you've brought us into the family. Thank you that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. Lord, you are good to us. Thank you for that. Lord, I pray, pray blessing on, on all of us, Lord, your people. I ask that we walk away from this different because of you. Lord, we love you, we trust you, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.